Well, I know that your order of worship in your bulletin says that the text we'll be in would be 1 Samuel 28, but that is not the case. Uh, I am going to resume our 1 Samuel study, uh, God willing, next week. We are moving uh, quickly to the conclusion of that study, uh, probably within two or three weeks. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm pausing that series, there's num- several reasons, but one is uh, just to thank you for your great patience because at this point, Saul has been chasing David for a long, long time. So, we are going to pause that for just a moment, and we're going to go over to the book of Jude. So I want to encourage you to find your way in your copy of God's Word to the book of Jude. And as you find your way there, I just want to take this opportunity to say what I don't think that I say often enough. And I think this goes for uh, in our families, in our relationships with our spouses... At least it is the case for myself that I so often take my wife, my children for granted. I don't as often as I should express my great love and appreciation and thankfulness to God for them. And I think that can often be the case for each other too. And I just want to say again that I am humbled and honored to week by week stand behind this sacred desk with the great privilege and responsibility of bringing God's Word to you. And not only do I have that privilege week in and week out from this pulpit, but also just to be involved in your lives and your families. And so what I wanted to do today is just take a moment to simultaneously allow God's Word to encourage us and convict us. I want to simply take a few moments to encourage you, encourage myself, but also to challenge us, to be very careful not to rest at ease in our complacency. But here's the real problem that I have really every time I stand in this space, and that is the fact that I'm not able to do that. That's a simple fact of the matter. In fact, I have no words in and of myself that are any benefit to you whatsoever. Oh, I can share with you my opinion on this or on that. But is that really what we need? (laughs) No. In fact, my opinion is no more valuable than anyone else's opinion. We're not interested in opinions. I'm not going to be preaching to you today from the latest issue of Reader's Digest, or Sports Illustrated. What we need is a word from the Lord. That's what makes the difference. By myself, I honestly don't have anything of worth to say to you, but thankfully God does. And isn't it amazing how often we don't even realize how desperately we need God to reveal himself in his word to us until he does. And we're amazed at how we needed what we didn't even know we needed. Now let me say this in addition to that. If we ourselves don't often even know what we need, how could I possibly know what you need? But here's the beauty of it. God does know what we need even when we don't. Which is why I believe the systematic, continual preaching of the word without picking and choosing what I think is most relevant or most attractive or most exciting is always the best. So on this Lord's Day, as every Lord's Day, let's hear the word of God. The Lord. Now, first of all, we come to this little book that is a total of 25 verses, just one chapter. And I want us to look mainly at the final verses of this epistle, the letter of Jude. A little bit of background Jude was Jesus' brother, half brother, obviously. Uh, Jude writes to Christians with a burden on his heart. 
And notice just in the introduction, this is not what we'll be focusing on primarily, but there is a great deal of information here for us to see. Jude, a, a doulos, again, I don't want to hammer this too much, but I, why English translators insist on translating doulos as servant, I have no idea. It is a slave. Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. To those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And then notice the transition that he makes. There's trouble in this church. There's trouble in, in the recipients of this letter from Jude. See, over the course of 30 years or so since Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended to heaven, some disturbing things have started to occur. In fact, Jude describes the situation. Look at verses 3 and 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. What is being experienced among the recipients of Jews' letters is a gradual deterioration, a corrosion, a, a, a gradual breakdown of the essence and the truthfulness of the gospel. They're satisfying themselves. They're, they're settling, if you will, for something less than the best, something less than the true gospel. It happens to us so often, doesn't it? I, I would say the greatest, the greatest challenge I face personally in my Christian life, probably more than any other challenge, is drift. Gradual, unnoticed drift. Just like on the ocean. You're in a raft, you're in the middle of the ocean, you lay down in the bottom of the raft, go to sleep, wake up eight hours later, you are not in the same spot you were. If we're sleeping when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to this faith once and for all handed down to the saints, we will drift. And through our drift, eventually, we won't even know where we are anymore. Which is truly what I believe is happening in many places that pass in name only as churches or Christians today. So he describes this desperate situation. I wanted to write to you about a happier topic. But I found it necessary. I had to stop. It's very, very similar to the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 6, right? I wanted to move on to some meat, but you're still on milk. So let's digress and go over some important things. And so he tells them, that they must contend for the faith. Contend is an interesting word, isn't it? It's not a word we really use very often. Really, probably the only common usage would be like a contender to the title, like in boxing. Who's the contender to the crown? So it carries with it this emphasis of, of strive for, fight for, stand up for, don't back down, don't be satisfied, push ahead. And then the following verses through verse 16 are a further description of the problem. And the problem is that there are certain people who have crept in, verse 4. Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how it is astonishing to me how often the New Testament speaks to the issue of false teachers and false teaching. It's astonishingly, it's an astonishingly large portion of Scripture. 
And, and what is so shocking is it was so prevalent three decades from Jesus' resurrection. How much more prevalent is it 2,000 years from Jesus' resurrection? So he talks about the, this problem, and he goes through several examples. Um, Egypt, he got, Jesus uh, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt. He talks about the angels that left their position of authority. That's an interesting discussion for another day. They talk about, uh, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. He talks about Michael's behavior regarding disputing over the body of Moses. Another interesting discussion for another day. He talks about all of God's faithfulness. He talks about Balaam's era, era and Korah's rebellion and he summarizes it all in verse 16 by saying, These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. That's the problem. And we're really not going to spend any more time this morning on the problem, although a, a more lengthy study on the book of Jude is certainly a valuable endeavor. But we want to pick up in verse 17 and look at what he says is the solution to the problem. False teachers exist. They're going to be there. They're there now. You don't have to look far, especially in an age of mass media, um, in social media, in the proliferation of all kinds of religious TV stations, religious radio stations, podcasts. It is it is a sea of danger out there. More than ever before, because, I mean, consider just 20, 30 years ago. You might have access to a radio station where big-name preachers, very popular preachers, are going to be preaching. But other than that, you heard your local pastor. Now we live in a day where you could easily listen to a different pastor every day hour of every day and never come even close to exhausting all of the possibilities. And I assure you, they're not all preaching the true gospel. So what's the solution? Verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ they said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. What a beautiful doxology there at the end. and We're going to talk about that. But notice the steps, if you will. The imperatives in the paragraph from verse 17 through 23. So continue with the flow. Kind of keep this in the back of your mind. Hey, there's a problem. Jude wanted to write to them about something really encouraging. And he talks about our mutual salvation. You know, that could, that could encompass a large number of issues. It could encompass a, a potentially a discussion of heaven. Right? That's like the big question of interest. Like, what's heaven going to be like? But it's almost as if Jude says, you know, I would love to talk to you about the beauty of heaven, but I'm not even sure you're going there. So let's get some basics handled first, and then we'll move on 
to the more interesting subjects. I'm being somewhat facetious, but you understand what I mean. He tells them what to do. He said, but you, contrary to the scoffers, contrary to the false teachers, contrary to those who cause dissension and division, you remember the predictions. Remember the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. They should not have been surprised that there were false teachers that had crept in, that had weaseled into their homes, into their congregations. Why? Because both Jesus and the apostles predicted it. Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, in Matthew, tells the apostles outright, before even his own death, like, listen, times are going to be tough. Things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. Paul talks extensively about this in the pastoral epistles in Timothy and Titus. Peter talks at great length about the danger of false teachers. Of these who would be weaseling or creeping into the congregations. These Christians were in turmoil because of the confusion brought into the church because of these people. And who were the people? Well, Scripture gives us a couple of different words that we need to understand. The first one is they are scoffers. What is a scoffer? Well, if you look just a couple of pages prior in Scripture to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Notice how similar what Peter says is to what Jude says. Let's look at verse 1 of 2 Peter 3. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Right? What, did you, what did you just tell him? Remember. Peter says this is by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Almost word for word to what Jude says. Knowing this, first of all, first of all, not top ten, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. Some scholars would say that Jude is even going so far as to quote Peter here, uh, or a source that uh, was uh, both were drawing from. I would say, yeah, that's true, and his name is the Holy Spirit. That's the source that they're both drawing from. But the simple fact is these were uh, people who were claiming to be Christians who doubted the second coming. That's what they are. They're scoffers. They're scoffing. They're skeptics. They, you know any, you know any skeptics or scoffers when it, they, it comes to your faith? I mean, now with the rise of the new atheism, I mean, forget about a clear articulation of the gospel you are likely to get scoffed at even with a claim of believing in God, even believing in the reality of immaterial things in the universe. Any of you not naturalism or secularism will often draw scoffing. According to verse 18 says that they will follow their own ungodly passions. They doubted the power of God. They followed their passion. What is your passion? Your passion in the in the Greek sense means suffering, but but passion in the way this passage is using it and the way we often use it is is what you desire, right? High schooler might go into his guidance counselor or her guidance counselor and say, I don't know what to do after I graduate. And the counselor says something like, what are you passionate about? 
What are your passions? That's not bad advice. What do you want? What do you desire? Sometimes passions can be deadly deceptive. Because when a passion rises out of the sin nature, it is not a God-honoring passion. The passion of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are things that should be killed. And how does that relate to the false teachers? The false teachers are preaching a gospel that is in its essence an appeal to the passions that people are already experiencing in their sinful nature. What they already want. What do humans want? Just think about a few things just right off the top of your head. We want to be pain-free. We want to have plenty of money. We want social acceptance, maybe even popularity. We want recognition. We want pats on the back. We want people to say, good job and attaboy. We want to have uh, things that make us feel good. On one level, there's nothing wrong with that. But prior to regeneration, what does our nature desire? The things of this world. Just look at what people pursue. They act out of greed. They act out of vengefulness. They act out of uh, sexually immoral motives. Act out of all kinds of things. Well, if you're a false teacher that is doing what Jude is saying here, that is... Um, I lost my place. Where was I? Verse 18. That in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions, then you're going to be leading people to follow their ungodly passions. Not teaching people to die to themselves in Christ, to take up your cross and follow Christ. That the call to the Christian life is a call to come and die, a call to die to your agenda, die to your goals, live unto Christ and only Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives through me. It's not a call to do that. It's a call that you will see if you look at what passes for Christianity so often today. It is an appeal to what people already naturally want in their sinfulness. Bigger houses, bigger cars, perfect health, no suffering. They are prosperity peddlers. One person described it like this. He says, listen to a preacher and you'll know what's in his heart. It's that simple. They want to talk of material prosperity. They want to talk of freedom in Christ. Not the kind of biblical freedom in Christ, but freedom as in almost an antinomianism. No holds barred. I can do whatever I want because I'm free in Christ. They want to talk about personal satisfaction and fulfillment. And all of that is simply their inability to cover their own self-indulgence. The prosperity gospel, dear friends, is a form of justified lust that mocks those who truly hunger for righteousness. According to verse 19, are these... Um, are these just Christians or leaders or pastors or teachers that are just a little off, a little confused, need to get some things straight, some things lined out? Well, look at what verse 19 says. It is these who cause division, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. Devoid of the Spirit is a phrase that is equivalent to not a follower of Christ, not a believer, not saved, unconverted, unregenerate, unjustified, lost. In other words, it's someone who has bought into and who is preaching a different gospel. A different gospel altogether. Some of the strongest language in all of the Pauline Epistles occurs in Galatians 
Very similar to what Jude is describing. Listen to Galatians 1, verse 6. He says, I am astonished. Now you just imagine, this is a beloved pastor, missionary, who's come and shared the gospel, established a church, and now he's heard some news about the church, and here's what he says in response. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. He qualifies, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, anathema. Absolutely apart from God. And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. And then he goes on to equate that kind of preaching with a preaching that desires the approval of man rather than the approval of God. Anyone who waters down the truth and teaches a kind of universalism or a kind of all roads lead to Christ, everybody's going to heaven. Anyone who denies the word of God is a scoffer. You've heard me say on numerous occasions, the exclusivity of Christ is the greatest stumbling block to the world of anything. To say that there is one way and only that way is the height of arrogance to people who are still in their sin. So the first remedy is very simply to remember Whatever the issue we're faced with, we'll remember and rely on the Word of God to constantly be going back to what is God's standard. We do not have to participate in um, relative, comparative, situational ethics. What do I think about this issue? God's Word is the final standard. If God says it is wrong, it is wrong. It does not matter the winds of the culture. We see more and more every day, it is becoming more and more criminal, more and more criminal to call sin, sin. I don't know if it's true. You can't, it's hard to know what's true on the internet, but uh, I read one article that said that a pastor had been fired for putting on their church billboard um, something that, uh, I don't know the details of what he said, but basically it equated homosexuality with sin. And, and the other issue we have to face is that not only are people teaching a different gospel, but they're saying that outright we need to change the gospel. There are those who would say that the church has to change or die. That's exactly the terminology they will use. The church in America must change or die. And what they mean by change is not change the color of the carpets. What they're talking about is fundamentally changing the message from the exclusivity of Christ to the inclusivity of the church to all comers. No calling out of sin, no guilt. They say we have to catch up to the times. We must embrace a wide variety of interpretations and opinions when it comes to Scripture. In fact, there is a small segment of, what is a word I can use that will not get me in too much trouble? Um, Delusional people who think that in order for the gospel to have success, we must unhitch 
from the Old Testament. We must, we must get rid of the Old Testament because the Old Testament pre- presents a God of, of uh, you know, wrath and anger and, and killing people, and, and that's not the God of the New Testament. It's an ancient heresy called Marcionism. But the second action point comes when he says in verse 20, the second, but you, beloved, but you, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep, that's really the key imperative, keep yourselves in the love of God. Remain would be another way to say that. Remain in the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. So remember the faith once and for all delivered to the saints and then remain in it. Be rooted in it, grounded in it, anchored to it. Remain in it. Keep yourselves. This is Jude continuing to show these Christians the remedy for false teachers. How can you move forward in such a troubled time? How can we know what to do when things are so confusing? Remain in the love of God. Remain in the gospel of Christ. Now notice, this is not talking about salvation. He's not saying, remain saved. He's saying, remain obedient. Obedience, particularly in three areas that are the surrounding participles. You've got an imperative Remain, or stay, keep, keep yourselves, surrounded by three participles. The first one is building. Building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. We are to constantly buttress our knowledge of the truth. This goes back to the remembering idea, right? We must know what we believe. Who are we? There's a number of ways we can do that. We've we've emphasized the definition of a disciple, that a disciple is one who worships Jesus, is changed by Jesus, is sent by Jesus. A disciple is one who is an apprentice of Jesus. Church must be healthy through the expositional preaching of the Word, through a sound theology, through an understanding of the gospel, an understanding of conversion, an understanding of evangelism and discipleship and discipline and fellowship and all of those things that go into it. But I would say more than anything that God is glorified through His Son when His Son is exalted in this place. I want this church to be an anchor of truth and depth as the world around us seemingly sinks deeper into an abyss of theological infusion and biblical anemia. But we must remember the goal of discipleship is not information intake. Remember that. We're not just filling our minds with Bible trivia facts. The goal of discipleship is life change. It includes information intake, but that's not where it ends. We do not want to be so orthodox that we don't live out orthopraxy in our lives. Right doctrine and right practice. Living lives of holiness, desiring holiness, desiring godliness. We don't have it perfectly. But we strive for it, right? That's what he says. Keep yourself. Focus. Think about it. Don't allow yourself to drift. Don't rest on your laurels. Once saved, always saved. I can do whatever I want. No, fight. Fight for that faith once and for all handed down to the saints. He says to do it also through praying. Did you notice that that in contrast to the scoffers, who had not the Holy Spirit, this prayer is according to the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. They are absent the Holy Spirit, but we pray by and through the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit makes intercession. The Son makes intercession on our behalf. And then finally, what does he say? Waiting. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Waiting. For the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We need to live every moment with an anticipation of Christ's return. We'll talk a lot more about this when we get into um, the book of Revelation. I'm just going to say very, very quickly. Uh, Of course, I was raised in a Southern Baptist, very dispensational, which means pre-tribulational rapture view of the end times. And the one thing I can say about that system that is advantageous to believers is we need to, whether, you, whether you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture or, 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 or that Jesus' coming is all one event, that kind of anticipation is how we ought to live our lives. I remember in the, in the environment that I was raised in, that was hammered constantly. Like, you never know you're going to be raptured. So I'd go into a room that I thought to be in, and she wasn't there, and I was genuinely frightened, and hit my knees, and prayed the Billy Graham prayer, and was, don't leave me, Lord, right? Now, I think that's an extreme example. I don't, I don't, I'm not encouraging you to be fearful in that way, but it was an expectant kind of readiness. So, we don't have to necessarily understand it in that ways of a thief in the night or left behind where, you know, there's just like clothes left. But we do need to be ready for his return. Because he is coming again. Revelation twenty two twenty. He who testifies to these things says, John says, Surely, or Jesus says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. And then John says, Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And then finally, redeem. Redeem according to the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. The next imperatives are to have mercy, or to save, or to show mercy. Verse 22. We must never be content merely with growing in our relationship with Jesus without letting that outflow into creating of, and fostering and cultivating disciples of other people who don't know the Lord. You want to know the true mark of Christian maturity? The true mark is not that you can win any battle of Bible trivia. The true mark is you're making disciples. You are a disciple who is making other disciples. Not that you make them in that sense, right? But Jesus, it's his biblical language. Jesus says, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, right? But think about it this way. It's cultivating. Like a farmer cultivates, right? He prepares the ground for the crop. He puts in the seed, the seed begins to sprout. He goes through and removes the harmful weeds. He removes the pests, maybe even with a pesticide. He protects the crop. He harvests the crop. He protects it, doesn't want to waste it, right? Is there somebody in your life that you're investing in that way? Maybe they're a brand new believer. Maybe they're not a believer at all. Here's something I've challenged myself to do, and I I can't really point my finger at you and say, do like I do on this because I haven't been faithful to do it. One of my problems in life, and I've been not very transparent about this, is I have no non-Christian friends. I mean, my whole life is you guys. My whole life is the church. And so I've got to be intentional about befriending non-Christians with the desire to share the gospel with them. And then when they do come to faith in the gospel, not just say, okay, walk down the aisle, we're going to dunk in some water, see you later, but to cultivate them. To, to bring them along, to help them to understand more about what it means to be an apprentice of Christ, a follower of Christ, who is growing away from the world to Jesus. And I would encourage all of us to do that. I would encourage you to, we can call it anything we want to, but think about one, two, or three people that you would put on a list that you want to be intentional about discipling over the next year doesn't mean you save them, but you're helping to disciple them. 
I pray that God will grant us a fresh urgency for the lost. A genuine desire for God to save them. Now, let me close with this very quickly. I know we're out of time, but someone might interpret all that we have said as being kind of like a little pep talk to try harder. Try harder, Christians. And I always remind you that if the message that is preached could be preached without controversy in a Muslim mosque, it's not a biblical message. It's not a biblical sermon. The best part of these verses is something very particular. Notice this amazing balance that is so much to the glory of God. Look how man-centered a reading of verse 17 and following looks like, appears to be on the surface. But you remember. Then in verse 20, but you build yourselves up. Pray, keep yourselves in the love of God. Wait on the Lord. You have mercy. If you don't have mercy, it's your fault. Right? Save others. Snatch them from the fire. Hate sin. Imperatives, right? Learn what an imperative was by it's always a sentence that starts with what? You. You go. You run. You jump. You talk. And you're like, wow, that's an unbelievably difficult responsibility. I don't think that I can do that. And if you said that, you'd be exactly right. Because you're not able to do that. Friends, can I tell you, if it is up to me to keep myself in the love of God, I'm not in the love of God. I have no power in and of myself to, to accomplish the things that he is saying that we must do. Augustine said it well. He said this, Lord, command what you will, but give what you command. Command what you will, but give what you command. Here's the beautiful part of the passage. Look at verse 24 where the doxology begins. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. You keep yourselves in the love of God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Do you see how that works so beautifully with this intersection of our responsibility and God's absolute sovereignty. Paul talks about this in Philippians. This last verse, I'm going to share it with you and then we're done. In chapter 3 of Philippians. Uh, not, not chapter 3, chapter 2 of Philippians, chapter 12. It's chapter 2, verse 12, sorry. Chapter 2, verse 12. This is a good example of what he's saying. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Whose responsibility is it to work out your salvation according to Philippians 2.12? Mine. Yours. But then look at the very next verse. For it is God who works in you. So that we're told to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, and yet God gets 100% of the glory in my growth, in my discipleship, in my sanctification, in my salvation. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Only God can do what we've spoken of, friends. Only God has the power to protect us from the evils that would cause us to drift. Our responsibility is to die unto him. Die unto self, live unto Christ. And I would go so far as to say the success of Oak Crest as a congregation is in many ways dependent upon our level of embrace 
to verses 24 and 25. Is this our view of God? Is this who you think of when you think of God? To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. The same yesterday, today, and forever the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end the first and the last the founder and finisher of our faith this is our god would you stand with me as we close father you are supreme in all things And yet you have not left us without responsibility. We know that salvation is all of you, but Lord, we strive in the process of sanctification, trusting ourselves totally and wholly to you for the final product. We know that without you, we cannot accomplish anything that you have called us to do. And yet with you, we can say with confidence that all things are possible for those who are in Christ Jesus. Bless now this time of response that you might be glorified, that you might move in our hearts, that you might impress these things upon us, that your supreme sovereignty in all things would be in no way used as an excuse for a complacent, dull, disinterested view of the lost but that it is, very, it is the very reason that you have for yourself a people that drives us and motivates us to a greater mission. Our worship fuels the mission, and worship is the goal of the mission. Teach us these truths in Jesus' name. Amen.